Today, we're looking at magnets. Very mysterious things when you start getting into it. And specifically, we're gonna look at something known as ferromagnets. Now, these are really interesting materials. These are materials that on their own have their own magnetic field. And there's very few types of materials that actually have this property. And one of them that you probably know of is iron. There's such thing as a magnetized iron bar. And it consists of this internal magnetization that creates a magnetic field itself. And now, if you've done an undergraduate physics degree, even as far as third year, you don't really learn a whole lot about what magnetization means. You know that materials can possess something called a magnetization and that that will produce a magnetic field in that material, for example, but you don't really know where it comes from. Now, if you go so far as to take statistical mechanics, you've probably looked at something called the Ising model. And the Ising model is one of the simplest models out there for a magnet. We're gonna solve the Ising model using the Metropolis algorithm, a specific algorithm designed to get to the equilibrium state of the magnetic lattice at a particular temperature. We'll implement it in Python and specifically we'll use Numba to speed up the code. Without further ado, let's begin. Permanent magnets, impossible. It all makes sense now, we got them stat mechanics Partition function in that thermal bath, cure my panics We got them iron atoms, they got that up-down spin Arrange them on a lattice, come to equilibrium Just need some Monte Carlo for that icing model Gotta let it run a while, turn that PC on full throttle Analytic solution, I prefer numerical Let's see that phase shift action, Python baby, here we go Packages today, we got NumPy, we got matplotlib for plotting, we're going to use a nice looking plotting style, and we have Numba for making the algorithm we're going to implement today very efficient. Uh, we also have a few functions from SciPy, which we're going to use actually to get the energy of the system. Uh, before we start the actual coding part, I want to review a few things from statistical mechanics, a few things that are somewhat non-trivial, especially if you're not familiar with the subject. So a system, right? You have a system in thermal equilibrium with a temperature bath. So what does that mean? It means you have a the system is not isolated. The system is there, but it's surrounded by, you know, temperature, an outer system that has a certain temperature. And that's a, you know, particular thing. Like that that's most systems are like that. Like I'm walking through the air, I'm in a temperature bath. So the probability, which I denote P um, mu of being in a state mu with energy E mu is equal to this here. So P mu is one over Z, E to the minus beta times E mu. That's known as the Boltzmann distribution. And it looks, you know, maybe fancy or whatever. All it is is a probability distribution. There's, you know, a bunch of different states that your system could take, right? Um, and there's a probability associated with each state of finding the system in that state. And it's just an exponential E to the minus beta times E mu. You tell me the energy and I'll tell you the probability that you'll be in that state. And Z is a normalizing constant and it's known as the partition function. And it's not just any normalizing constant, it's a very, very special quantity. And it turns out if you know the partition function, there's a lot you can get for various um, thermodynamic systems. So um, obviously a system could be put in a temperature bath and it will change over time and it might reach equilibrium. So I'm gonna give you a few conditions that are necessarily true at equilibrium. At equilibrium, the following must hold. Hold. So remember, P mu is the probability of being in a certain state. Well, I sum over all states nu, or it looks like a little v. I'll call it v just to um, not confuse the things. But the probability of being in that state times the probability of going to another state, summing over all other states, is equal to the probability of being in all other states coming to that state. And if you look at this equation, it's not quite obvious what that means. It's a little bit more obvious if you look at this diagram here. So you're in your state mu, right? A fixed state of the system. And what I'm telling you is these red arrows, that's the probability of going mu to V. And I also have all these circles and I have them different sizes because I want you to think of the size as being like the probability that you're in that state. So some states, right, for going from mu to here, there's less of a probability that you're in that state, more of a probability you're here, here, and et cetera. And so there's a probability of being in all the states represented by the circles. 
And there's also the probability rates of exchanging between states. And so by summing over um, V, I'm gonna call it V instead of new here, summing over means I'm summing over all the red arrows. So um, here I'm going from new to V, this left-hand side is summing over all the red arrows here. And I'm just summing up you know, the probability of being in uh, this state here times this probability here. And basically what it means is everything that's going out, like er as much as it's changing into other states, it's also coming back into that state. Remember here, this state going from uh, V to Mu with the blue arrows summing back inwards. So you're not shifting over and gradually becoming in a different state. If you do go to another state, you're you know coming back to that state as often. That's sort of what it says. And that's uh, known as the detailed balance um, condition. Uh, but for numerical methods, it's kind of hard to um, have this be true. It's, it's a sum over a lot of states, but we can enforce it. We can make it be true if we just set this true here. So rather than have it be true for the sum, have it be true for every term. And so if your system dances around in this sort of way, then this sum will hold two, right? If I, because I just sum over V on both sides here, and then it makes it so that um, it's true in both cases. Uh, so um, what that means is rather than considering it as going to all other states, I consider just one red arrow and one blue arrow. And the probability of being here times the probability of going to this state here is equal to the probability of being here times the probability of going back to mu. And so that makes it so it's in a deep, you're in a balance, right? You're not going off anywhere. You're sort of balanced so that, yeah, the system might change states at equilibrium, you know, very in a minor sort of way, but it's always sort of coming back. So the system is sort of moving around, but it's always sort of staying fixed in the same sort of place. Um, now we'll talk about the Ising model. This is the model for a ferromagnetic material. And like I said in the introduction, there are very few ferromagnetic materials. So you have a lattice of atoms, atom, 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 atom. These might be iron atoms, right? In and out, like, you know, you have a solid iron. There's a bunch of atoms all together. And those um, atoms are either spin up or spin down, right? So here's a 2D lattice here. And I have some spin up, sigma's plus one blue arrows and spin down, sigma's red um, negative quantities, right? And so that, that's essentially the model, right? You have spin up, spin down, and they're distributed in a lattice and they're equally spaced apart. So what you know from that equation is that the total energy E mu here, make it a little bit bigger, is equal to minus J, sigma I sigma J, and this weird sum here. And you think, what the heck is that? Well, this is the sum over nearest neighbors. So what that means is that, you know, I take say this red arrow in the middle here. And if I want to find the energy associated at that point in the um, lattice, I sum only the nearest neighbors. So up, left, down, right. So here I have, um, and I'm summing sigma I sigma J. So what that means, you know, ignore this capital J, that's just a proportionality factor. But here I have minus one times minus one. So that's plus one, minus one times plus one. So minus one, so one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Remember negative one times plus one is negative one. So one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So one minus three. So the energy associated with this and its nearest neighbors is negative two, right? And you do that for all pairs here. And the ones on the outside, it only has two nearest neighbors. So here it's negative one, negative one. So the energy associated with that is negative two, right? Um, so that's uh, not too complicated. Um, and so then you sum together nearest neighbors like that and you get your energy. So you have to do it for all these. So you sum this guy's nearest neighbors this guy here and his nearest neighbors and all the things here and you multiply it by this factor j of course j could be brought outside the sum and you get the total energy um so remember that mu here corresponds to a particular state so this would be like one state of our system but there could also be a state new right and state new might have this center spin flipped upwards and that has a different energy associated with it and there's a different probability of being in that state new right you know here's the state down so suppose our state mu here is equal to what we see here well state new might be this little circle here maybe it's less energy and i flip this state upwards right and so there's a different probability with being associated with those two things and you think how do i get the probability of each one well you can do that 
using the Boltzmann distribution here. And it's actually better to take the ratio of the probabilities, but using detailed balance here, I can write the ratio of the transitions equal to the ratio of the probabilities of being in those two states. And this is just the ratio of the Boltzmann distribution and I get a quantity like this. So this tells me the likelihood ratio of being in those two states. One state is gonna be more likely than the other. Um, and so, you know, suppose you start your lattice in a random condition, right? And you enforce the condition of detailed balance. What's gonna happen is the system's gonna dance around and then eventually it's gonna reach an equilibrium state, right? So it's our job to make the system dance around in such a way that you have these uh, transition probabilities and we have to manually code the transition probabilities ourselves. So we're gonna flip a spin and we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna, you know, based on the energies, based on this quantity here, we'll either go to that other state or we won't, right? That's the transition probability. It either will happen or it won't happen. So this is where the Metropolis algorithm comes into play. So we want to find the equilibrium state um, mu. And of course, there's the equilibrium state, but it's also sort of going around and other, like the spins will still flip. Like I said, detailed balance allows it so that the thing is going in and out of a bunch of different states, but there's sort of an equilibrium, you know, condition going on where it's all going nice and fine. You're not shifting over to anything. Um, and we want to find it at a particular temperature beta. Remember that beta is equal to one over KT. And I'm going to call beta temperature. It, it doesn't matter. So basically what we really want to find is how many sigma i's are plus one and how many are minus one. At a particular temperature, the spins are going to arrange themselves in a certain way. So we'll start with a random lattice of spins, right? Some will be up and some will be down and we'll put it in the temperature bath and we're going to see it dances around for a while. What's it's going to look like when it comes out. So this is how the algorithm works. Uh, we call our initial state mu. So we have a, we start with a random state of spins. We call that mu. We pick a random arrow, right? A random spin and we flip it and we call that state new or V I call in this video. We want to find the probability P mu to V that we're going to accept this new state. So we're either going to change states or we're not. So, and we'll use detailed balance for that. So there's two different things here. If E V is greater than E mu, right? Then we set P mu to mu is equal to one. Remember that this equation here, ignore the center term. You know, I could pick one of these and then choose the other one, right? So in the case where E uh, V is greater than E mu, I'm going to pick the bottom one equal to one so that the top one here is equal to E to the minus beta E uh, V minus E mu. So that's our probability. So we flip it and then we say, okay, if the probability, uh, we're going to keep it with a probability equal to this. So we need to evaluate that term. But if E mu is greater than E uh, V, then we're going to set P mu to V is equal to one. So we have this uh, equation here. And we'll just say we'll set um, this equation is equal to one. Remember, if in that case, uh, this quantity here is going to be greater than one. So we can set this equal to one. And then this is going to be less than one. Think about that for a sec. If E mu is greater than EV, this quantity here is greater than one. And if we set this equal to one, then this can still be less than or equal to one. So we're we're sort of manually fixing things so that we eventually lead the system into an equilibrium state. Uh, so uh, we'll set this equal to one. And that just means that, you know, if we flip the spin and the energy is less, right? EV is our new, or EV is our new state, then we keep it. And if our energy is more, then we only accept it with a certain probability. So then we flip it once right? We flip one thing. And then we do that over and over and over and over again. We pick a random spin, we flip it, and then we decide whether to keep it or not. And we do it over and over and over and over again. And as you do it for like millions and millions of time steps, or actually not millions, about thousands and thousands of time steps, eventually all the spins will tend to orient themselves in a sort of equilibrium state. So basically the only thing we need to evaluate for this is minus beta times EV minus E mu, which is of course what we need here for the transition probability if the new state has more energy than our previous state. And this is equal to this quantity here. So we need to evaluate this, um, where I is the spin being flipped. So we pick one and we sum over its nearest neighbors here, right? 
This is what the difference in energies are because most of it is going to be the same except for the area where we flip the spin and we only need that sum over the neighbors for that one. And that's equal to minus beta J times this. So because beta J shows up together, we're going to keep that as a variable here. Um, so that's basically everything established, right? You have the Metropolis algorithm. And again, as a summary, initial state, right? Could be random. You let the system dance around with, e uh, with um, distributed balance condition, and eventually all the spins are going to flip so that eventually it goes to equilibrium. So I'm going to make a 50 by 50 grid of spins. So N is equal to 50. And what we'll do now is we'll generate some initial random grids of spins. And so what I'm going to do is I'll make an initial uh, random array. So let me uh, run this code here. So first of all, init random is going to help us here. And it random is just a 2D array with, uh, you know, random values between zero and one. Of course, the spin is plus or minus one, but you're going to see how this leads to that. So this is going to be um, an it random. And then I'll make a, a lattice called lattice N. N is for negative, negative spin. And I say if it's greater than or equal to 0 0.75, set it equal to one. And if it's less than 0 0.75, set it equal to minus one. So about 25% of these will be greater than or equal to 0 0.75 because they're uniform. So 75% of them are going to be spin positive for lattice N. So if I look at lattice N here, I have minus ones and plus ones and 75% of them are going to be negative. I also have one where it's positive. So 75% of them are going to be positive and it will be random. So that's like our initial thing before we put it in the temperature bath. It's not quite a magnet yet. And it's not certainly not in equilibrium, but we put it in the temperature bath like that. So those are our initial states. And of course we can look at the initial lattice of spins like this. So uh, this is um, the positive one. So 75% of them are positive. You can see there's more yellow than purple. And these are our initial spins. It hasn't reached equilibrium yet. We're just setting our initial state and then we're going to put it in the temperature bath. So this is what this looks like. Uh, we also need a function to get the energy, right? And I'm going to use this later on to find the energy of our states over time. So again, there's, it should be like E is equal to minus J times this. But again, we need to deal with um, quantities that we can actually evaluate. And since Sigma I and Sigma J are just plus or minus one, this is a dimension less quantity, which is important. I'm very, you know, obsessed with dimensionless quantities in these numerical videos because it's all we can deal with numerically. So what it does is I give it the lattice, right? Something like this. And it will sum and it'll do that nearest neighbor sum on every single point and it will get the energy. Now, this is a somewhat complicated thing because that nearest neighbor sum is actually a convolution, right? To do this sum, it's complicated, right? Nearest neighbors, but it can be done very simply in um, a Python. So what I do is I, I create a kernel like this. This is a convolution that we're going to do. And I'll show you what this looks like. So this is a convolutional kernel. And you can see it's true, 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 true. So true, right? You know, suppose you have your uh, spin in the middle. It just means that these are the nearest neighbors like this. Up is near neighbor, 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 right? So that's our kernel. I convolve the lattice with the kernel and then I multiply it by lattice. And so remember our lattice looks like this. It's just plus or minus uh, lattice n, for example, just plus or minus ones. If I convolve it with that kernel that I show, right? I convolve it and then I multiply it again by the lattice. It turns out that that's equal to this sum. And I'll let you sort of go through that yourself and you have to convince yourself of this, but it's sort of non-trivial. There's other ways to do this, but this is the most efficient way to do this in Python. Um, is to sum it like this. So that'll give us the energy of any um, state that we have here. So I give it a lattice and it gives me the energy or it gives me E divided by J. So I can do this and I can plug in my lattice P and it will give me the energy here like this. So now we get to the fun part, the Metropolis algorithm. So here's how it's going to work. We're going to give it our initial state of the spins, right? Remember we have that initial state, some are spin up, and some are spin down, right? That's our initial before it reaches equilibrium. Uh, we're gonna give it the number of iterations that we wanna do in the algorithm. And uh, that's times here. Remember this corresponds to this. 
We're gonna give it the value of BJ. That's the temperature. Beta is one over KT. That specifies the temperature and it'll change depending on the different temperature. The algorithm will do something different and the initial energy of the lattice. Remember that initial, uh, that initial lattice has a specific energy. And now we're gonna follow the algorithm as I discussed earlier. So um, we take our initial spin array, right? This is our initial ups and downs. We'll make a copy of it so we don't change it. Uh, we're gonna have these arrays called net spins and net energy. As I go through the algorithm, right? The 2D array is gonna change. Some of the spins are gonna flip and stuff. And so over time, I want to keep track of what's the net spin and what's the net energy of our system as we go through the algorithm. And so I just create empty arrays and I'll update that as we go through the algorithm. So now we get to run the algorithm. So let's review, right? We call our current state mute. We pick a random particle on the lattice and flip the spin sign, right? So that's two. And you'll notice that the two here corresponds to step two. So I get a random X, Y coordinate on our lattice, right? And I get the initial spin and I get the spin after we do the flip, right? And initially there'll be a certain energy and I flip the spin and there'll be a different energy of the uh, system. So this is the proposed spin flip. Just multiply that whatever the spin is by minus one. And now we need to compute what's the change in energy in the system at this point. So I initially set the energies uh, before and after equal to zero, but uh, I, told you what the change in energy was uh, right here. Um, well, this is the total energy of the system. Um, and we need to compute this value here. We take our sigma I remember is the spin we want to flip and we need to compute the change in energy. So we basically need to take that and sum it around its nearest neighbors. And that will give us the change in energy minus beta times EV minus EMU. This is the quantity we need to evaluate. And that will be used in step three here. But first, let's just evaluate it. So we need to do this. So I scroll down. And so uh, all these here are just taking into account the boundary conditions, right? Because uh, something on like the left boundary isn't going to have a left neighbor. Something on the right boundary isn't going to have a right neighbor. So we need to make sure to take this into account. So um, we have our EI. This is what our energy is uh, before we did the spin flip. And we have our EF, which is our energy after the spin flip. And remember, there's the whole lattice, right? And there's a bunch of energy contribution from that too. But when we're computing the change in energy, we only need to worry about the sort of place where it changes. So then I sum and I get the nearest neighbor. Remember, spin I, this is sigma I times sigma J. And I do it for both EI and EF. And I do it here as well, sigma I times sigma J. For like almost all the points on this lattice, it's going to be all four of these. But at the boundaries, uh, there's not going to be all four of them sometimes. Uh, so that's EI minus EF. And uh, then we compute our change in energy. DE is EF minus EI, right? Uh, and now we need to change the state with the probabilities. This is the sort of complicated part of the algorithm. Um, so this is part three. If EV is greater than E mu, right? Then we set PV to mu equal to one. That's gonna be what we set. We can fix that. We have the detailed balance equation that we need to satisfy here. Well, we can choose to set one of these equal to whatever we want. And using this on the right hand side, we can uh, find the other one. So we're going to say, you know, are we actually going to keep that spin flip or not? Are we going to go from state mu to state V? There's going to be that with a certain probability. So uh, we set this equal to one. Then we, the detail bounce equation tells us what the other one needs to be. P mu to V is equal to E to the minus beta EV minus E mu. So this is the probability. We flip the spin. And the probability that we're actually going to keep that new state is equal to this. Uh, that will depend on beta uh, times EV minus E mu. And um, so that's our first case. So we need to make sure that e view, V is greater than E mu. And we also need to make sure that uh, we do it with a probability equal to this. So that's what I have here. So here's my DE. Now I say if the change in energy is positive, like I said, and here's our probability that we do the flip. And the way that I that we uh, do that with a certain probability is this is just a number, right? And I generate a random uniform number between zero and one. And if it's less than this value, then I do do the spin flip. So this, this only will change it with a certain probability. So if it is true, I take my spin array, the ups and downs of spins. I take the coordinate that I wanted to change and I set that equal to the, the spin, the proposed flip. 
So that's if DE is greater than zero. And then my energy, my current energy of the system, I'm, I'm keeping track of the energy, uh, just becomes the initial energy plus the change in energy. That's pretty obvious for systems. Uh, if the change in energy is less than zero, like I uh, explained up here, um, right? This is change in energy is less than zero. E, the new state is less than the old state. Then we just set P mu to V is equal to one, right? This is equal to one. This is going to be greater than one. Convince yourself of that. EV is greater than EMU. This quantity is greater than one. Set this value equal to one, and that allows PV to mu less than one. So our detailed balance equation is still set. We're still satisfying that in this case. So we set this equal to one. It just means that we do it all the time. So if the energy is less, then we flip the spin. That's essentially what we say. So I flip the spin. If it just always happens if DE is less than or equal to zero. Uh, so then I get a new state. So I take my initial state, I flip the spin. Maybe I do that with the probability. And um, that new state, I keep track of what the net spin of that new state is by summing all the spins together. And I also do that for the net energy as well, right? I keep track of the energy. The energy is being accumulated throughout the algorithm. Remember the energy changes here. And I keep track of what the energy is. And I do this over and over and over and over again. I pick a state, I decide whether or not to flip it, get the spin, get the energy, and do that like many, many, many thousands of times. And over time, the system will dance around and it will eventually come to an equilibrium state that we want. So I've kept track of the net spins and the net energy for the entire algorithm, like I mentioned. And so I can plot these as a function of time once I go through the algorithm. And of course I can do this for a particular lattice. So I'll start with my lattice N. Remember, this is the lattice where 75% of them are pointing downwards. Uh, I'm gonna use a million time steps here. So I do the spin flip thing a million times. Uh, our value of beta J, I'm actually gonna set this equal to 0 0.7 to start with. Um, fix that here. So I'll set beta J is equal to 0 0.7. And I feed it in the initial energy. That's what I do with my function here. I also have to feed it the initial energy. So, and then I get my spins and my energies as a function of the algorithm time steps. And over time, it should eventually come to a somewhat of an equilibrium state. So I can run this code. And it runs pretty quick because we're using number for efficiency. And I can plot the spin and energy as a function of the algorithm time steps. So what it says for beta J is equal to 0.7, my average spin, although it starts at minus 0.5, that's what happens when 75% of them are pointing down. I let the system dance around and eventually the average spin goes to about negative one. And the reason you see it oscillating here, right? If it just stayed in one state, it would be a flat blue curve, but it's oscillating. So it's in a detailed balance here. It's not staying in one state, but it's staying in an equilibrium where it sort of moves in and out of different states. Um, I can do the same thing for the energy and it's going to go to the least energy, right? It's going to go to a uh, favorable state of energy here. So this is where beta J is 0.7. So I can ask, what happens if I increase the temperature of the system? This is what happens for a particular temperature, but what if I change beta J? Remember to increase temperature, I have to decrease the value of beta because they're inversely proportional. So what happens if I increase the temperature, right? What happens to my spins over time? I can run this code again. And you see something weird. It's actually the exact opposite. Instead of the average spin going to negative one so that they're all aligned in the same direction, that's what happens when the, spins, the average spin is negative one. Now the average spin is zero. So they're sort of aligned and misaligned and they're not all pointing in the same direction. In other words, the magnetic material becomes demagnetized. So essentially what it says is if you have, if you have a magnet and you heat it up really hot, the temperature gets past a certain point and you lose the magnetization. If all the spins are pointing in the same direction, you have a magnet. But when, as soon as they become pointing in different directions, you no longer have a magnet anymore. And furthermore, the energy, right? So remember if I increase the temperature, I increase the energy of the thermal bath that the system is in. And so rather than the energy going to, you know, less energy, the bath actually provides enough energy so that the energy increases slightly and it stays at this state here. And so, you know, I've shown it for two different temperatures, but we can get an average value of M bar. So an average value would be once it reaches equilibrium, 
what's the average? And I can do that by taking an average of uh, the time series here in equilibrium. And I can do this for energy too. And I can get M bar and um, the average M bar. And I can also get E over J. Remember this energy is E over J, dimensionless quantity. Uh, I can find this too, an average value of this at different temperatures. And I can say, well, how does the average spin and the average energy in that sort of detailed bounce depend on temperature? Because you saw there was one temperature where it dropped to negative one and there's another temperature where it rises to zero. So there's something weird going on between those two temperatures that we should figure out. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take the average of the last 100,000 points on each array. That will give us about an average of M bar and E when the system is in equilibrium. And you can see that it reaches equilibrium pretty quick here. So the last 100,000 points is pretty safe uh, for most values. Uh, and I do that using this function here, this function get spin energy. So I feed it my lattice, right? My initial lattice. And I feed it a bunch of different temperatures. Those are BJs, beta J, different values of temperature. And what it will do is it'll run this algorithm. And for each temperature, it will take the average of the last 100,000 points, get an average spin, get an average energy. So I create uh, a bunch of M's and E means and e STDs. These are just empty arrays here to begin with. Then what I do is I loop through each value of the temperature. I get the spins and energies using the Metropolis algorithm. So spins and energies will just be an array that looks like this and an array that looks like this. Uh, and then I do exactly like I said, I take the last 100,000 points. I take the mean and that will give me the average spin for that particular temperature or that particular value of beta J. And I'll do that for energy too. And I also get the standard deviation of the energy because as it turns out, this also has really interesting um, uh, properties. It actually can help us get things like the heat capacity of the substance at a particular temperature uh, by using the standard deviation. So it, it, standard deviation, I mean the last 100,000 points, what's the standard deviation of this array? And it turns out, like I said, you can get the heat capacity from that. Uh, so I do this for a bunch of different temperatures, a, different, a bunch of different values of beta J. Uh, I go from 0 0.1 to 2. Remember here I did 0 0.2 and 0 0.7. So I'm going from 0 0.1 to 2 in steps of 0 0.05. So I'll have a bunch of different temperatures and I want to see what is the temperature where it goes instead of going to negative 1, it instead goes to 0. There's something weird going on there and it turns out that's a phase transition. Um, and so I'm going to do this for the underscore n here is for lattice n. Remember lattice n had 75% of them pointing down and underscore P. This is for the one where it had 75% of them pointing up to begin with. And so I can run this cell and it takes a little while to run because remember I have to do it for a bunch of different temperatures. All right, so the code is finished running. It takes about, mm, I would say three to five minutes. I should mention I did this in undergrad two without the use of Numba and it took about three hours to run. And I remember sitting my computer down and just letting it run and uh, computer heating up and it was awful. So with Numba, three hours to five minutes, uh, much, much faster. So now I have, like I said, I did this for a bunch of different temperature values and I'm gonna compute the average of this array at the end here. And I also get the standard deviation of the energy, like I said. And so I'm gonna get the average for a bunch of different temperatures and I'm gonna see how does that evolve with time. And so at some temperatures, it'll be negative one and at some temperatures it's zero. And there's probably a you know transition somewhere in between so i'm gonna get i'm gonna so we have m bar and e over j for many different values of beta j remember beta is purport, is related to the temperature so now i'm going to look at m bar the average spin in the lattice as a function of temperature t i'm going to stop dealing with beta i'm actually going to go to t now now remember beta is one over t k so t is equal to one over beta k k is boltzmann's constant but I only have values of beta J, right? I remember this whole time I dealt with beta J. So I have to um, multiply numerator and denominator by beta J like this. And so really, because I only have beta J, I'm actually gonna be look, I uh, multiply by K over J. So I, I multiply this equation times K over J and I can look at K over J times temperature, right? Because I only have beta J. I'm gonna be plotting one over beta J's so my X label is going to be K over J times T. And I'll plot the M's for the one where 75% of them were negative and 75% of them were positive, right? Those are two different initial um, states here. And I'm gonna say, okay, 
75% of them are negative. I let it dance around using the detailed balance condition at a particular temperature or at a, surrounded by a particular thermal bath. What's the end state gonna look like? And I'm gonna do the same thing for the positive ones, right? 75% of them are pointed upwards. Let it dance around and what happens? And this is what happens. So I'm gonna explain this plot very carefully here. Remember, x-axis is K over J times T. Temperature gets hotter as you move to the right. What does this say? Cold temperatures, you don't have a very strong thermal bath that the thing is um, surrounded in, right? So all the spins, it's energetic, energetically favorable for them to all point in the same direction. And you get M bars negative one. And the reason why 75% of them start a negative, they all go to minus one, right? because more of them start a negative than positive. They're not all gonna switch. When you start most of them positive, they're all gonna turn to go positive. So the green goes up here, right? It depends on your initial state as well. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter if they're up or down, it's the same energetically either way, but if you have more of them starting in one way than the other, then all of them are gonna sort of follow that way. It's the most popular thing to do for the spins. They're all gonna follow what their uh, partners are doing. Uh, same thing for the positive. Now, as I increase the temperature of the thermal bath, there's more thermal energy that the system has access to. And so even though it might be energetically favorable for them to all point in the same direction, that thermal bath provides the system with extra energy. And so as temperature increases, you get this phase transition here. And at high temperatures over on the right, the spins can all be oriented in random directions because the thermal bath allows that. If there were no thermal bath, right, it would all go to the most energetically favorable state, but you have that thermal bath, you have detailed balance condition, and you get this on the right here. Now, as one final thing, I'm gonna look at the heat capacity because I thought this was a cool application of this problem. So uh, for statistical mechanics, when dealing thing with things like this, uh, CV, which is the heat capacity, in when you're dealing with these statistics is equal to the standard deviation of the energy. So what I mean by that is at, there's a certain temperature here, right? Beta J is 0.7 and I can get the standard deviation of the energy, right? It's in equilibrium. It's still changing states. So the energy is going to be changing a little bit and there'll be a standard deviation of that energy. So CV is uh, the standard deviation of the energy divided by temperature squared. But of course I don't have the energy and I have to take into account the factor J. So um, this is the standard deviation of energy here, and I uh, write it in terms of beta and K. I divide by J because I always have J here. This is just some simple algebra, and I so divide by J squared, multiply by J squared, and I get the standard deviation of E divided by J. That's actually what I computed here, right? Remember, E is E over J in this uh, thing. So E STD is actually E divided by J, right? This standard deviation here is the standard deviation of E over J, which I have access to. So standard deviation of E over J, well, this is the variance because you're squaring it, uh, times beta J squared times K squared. Um, so I can plot this as a function of temperature, right? I have access to the standard deviation of energy. Um, remember, this is the average spin, but I also found the, av the standard deviation of the energy at different temperatures. So I can plot this whole quantity as a function of um, temperature, and I get the following plot like this. Now, there's two results here. There's one for where they start a negative and positive, and they should be the same. And this critical temperature where there's a phase transition, the metropolis algorithm is known to perform very poorly. So I wouldn't trust the results here, but you still, in the true results for the system, you do get that peak of heat capacity and then it goes down. So what is heat capacity? Well, you know that delta U is CV times delta T. So what it means is when I change the temperature, I turn up the temperature of the thermal bath, how much does the energy of the system change? And what it tells you is there's a particular, you know, temperature here where if I crank up the temperature a little bit, I add a lot of extra energy to that system. And that's because the spins start getting misaligned with each other. And I crank up the temperature and they really start getting misaligned and I really increase the energy of the system when I turn up the temperature. And, but then it goes back. And so then I, you know, turn up the temperature more and more and more. And, you know, I add, you know, less and less and less energy when I turn up the temperature. 
Whereas here I add more and more and more and more energy. So you get this interesting curve and this is the, the heat capacity curve for the Ising model system. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to like and subscribe. And once again, I'll see you next time.